Legacy uh, uh, Finance Committee meeting to order, and I members will be uh, uh, coming in, and I know some other members have some bills up and uh, um, and other committees. Um, we just had floor session, so our our apologies or our apologies to the our guests today. But uh, um, so can I move the? So I'd like to move the minutes. We have uh, two sets of minutes, and Representative Heitzman, have you had an opportunity uh, to peek at the minutes for uh, uh, January 25th? And if so, would you like to move those, please? I would move the minutes from January 25th, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any questions to the uh, January 25th uh, minutes? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, the minutes are passed. And then we have another set of minutes for uh, February 1st. And uh, Representative Heitzman, would you be willing to move the uh, minutes for the February 1st as well? I would move the uh, February 1st minutes as well, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Heitzman. Any questions in regards to those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Minutes are approved. Thank you uh, uh, very much to Representative Heitzman, and thank you for bringing a star guest today. Yes. We've had uh, other members uh, um, introduce ourselves, but please, uh, as a guest, would you be willing to introduce yourself and then maybe mention a, a park use that you've done, or because since we have Parks Day, or an outdoor heritage, an arts project. You said you were doing some art maybe on the house floor even, or uh, crafting. My name is Jane Heinzman. On the floor I was doing crochet, and we like to go to Cuyuna. <laughs> Thank you. Well, welcome. That is a beautiful park. If you have never been there, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, it's certainly a treasure, even a worldwide treasure, I believe. You've got worldwide recognition. Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, is there going to be an opportunity for us to uh, finally ride Cuyuna together, Mr. <laughs> Chairman? <laughs> I'd be I'd very much in favor of that. Riding the Red, it's called. They have red clay, and it's uh, Riding the Red, I think, is their nickname, right? Uh, Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it, it's red dirt, so oh. more often than not, we refer to the red dirt. It's somewhat like Maui, but not volcanic, so... <laughs> You can figure it out. It's the Iron Range. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this this morning we're continuing on the path of our presentations, and uh, we've kind of moved through uh, different areas of our funds, and now we're uh, transitioning to the parks and trails uh, and folks. And if you'd like to come up, and uh, I think everybody's here now, and then uh, kind of go through, uh, I believe you have a, a presentation that you've put together for us and uh, and so we'll we'll happily hear that if members have questions please uh, um, ask them and uh, we have some time allotted for this and uh, to do a deeper dive so there's basically uh, um, so 14.25 percent of our funds go to parks and trails and uh, maybe you're going to talk about that but it's Historically, it's been nice how the three systems that often get our funds, um, Greater Minnesota, the Metro uh, Council areas, and the DNR all come forward and then uh, uh, present. So I don't know what your plan is, who's first, but go ahead when you're ready, please. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning and good morning members of the committee. My name is Lisa Barajas. I'm the executive director of the Community Development Division at the Metropolitan Council. And on behalf of the Parks and Trails Legacy Partnership and along with Ann Pierce, the State Parks Director at the Minnesota DNR and Renee Madsen, the executive director of the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission, we do thank you for the opportunity to present the Parks and Trail Legacy Overview today. So we'll get into some of those details, uh, Chair Lilly, that you were uh, speaking to. Thank you. So we are the three Parks and Trail Legacy Partner Agencies, Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission, the Metropolitan Council, and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. 
We are responsible for overseeing Minnesota's parks and trails of state and regional significance, which is the focus of the 25 year uh, parks and trails legacy plan. And you'll see on the right hand side of the screen sort of a schematic there of the variety of different parks and trails opportunities within the state of Minnesota and where um, our responsibilities fall is in that those two middle circles. In 2008, Minnesotans passed the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment, which increased the state sales tax by three-eighths of 1% for 25 years to provide new funding for better habitat, water quality, arts and culture, and, of course, parks and trails, what we're here to talk about today. The pie chart here in front of you shows the four parts of the Legacy Fund, and as Chair Lilly noted, we'll be focusing on the uh, Legacy, uh, the Parks and Trails portion, which receives about 14% of the total fund. The vision created in the 25-year Parks and Trails Legacy Plan is to provide a seamless, accessible, and welcoming system of parks and trails for all Minnesotans. We are now just over halfway through the 25-year legacy implementation period, and we can confidently tell you that Parks and Trails Legacy Fund is having a profound impact on our three parks and trail systems in Minnesota. The 25-year Parks and Trails Legacy Plan identifies four strategic pillars that are illustrated here on the slide. Connecting people in the outdoors, that includes creating welcoming environments, conducting more effective marketing and outreach, and providing outdoor skill building and programming for people of all abilities. The second pillar, acquiring land and creating opportunities. Uh, the work here includes accelerating land acquisition, making high priority trail connections, filling critical gaps, and developing near home convenient recreational opportunities. The third pillar is taking care of what we have. As our outdoor system, uh, recreation system ages, it continues to need regular reinvestment to ensure safe and high quality opportunities continue to be available to all Minnesotans. This pillar includes investing in both the built environment as well as the natural environment. And finally, the fourth uh, pillar uh, is coordinating among partners. And this pillar represents this critical partnership that works toward creating a seamless system of state and regional parks and trails. It includes shared research to better understand the needs of our visitors, and it includes investing in technologies to make it easy for people to find what they want uh, when they want it. It also includes supporting our Parks and Trails Legacy Advisory Committee, which provides vital input into how our legacy work is implemented. So today, all three partners, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, continue to work together to engage with the public in many ways to advance the goals in the Parks and Trails Legacy Plan. As stated in the last slide, this includes the Parks and Trails Legacy Advisory Committee that provides guidance and champions the progress toward the 25-year Parks and Trails Legacy Plan. The 17-member volunteer body helps keep the partners on track and well integrated. The work also includes joint projects between other three partners here, DNR, the Council, and the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. These projects um, help us to work together to move us toward a more seamless system of nature-based outdoor recreation. Uh, examples of our work include developing user-friendly websites, coordinated research projects, and exploring how parks and art can help reach new visitors. Uh, the pandemic underscored the critical importance of our state and regional parks and trails to all Minnesotans. And if you were out, uh, out and about in the state over the last couple of years, you may have noted yourself the increased uh, visitorship, whether it was uh, folks riding, walking, or biking on trails, or folks uh, taking weekend jaunts out to their state park system uh, with uh, overflowing parking lots. I, I experienced that myself, <laughs> uh, going out the weekends with my children. Uh, people visited our units in record numbers during this very difficult time, finding refuge uh, and well-being uh, in uh, the outdoors and uh, opportunities to engage and uh, see friends and neighbors and family um, in a safe setting. We found many of the visitors were new to our parks and trails as well, and now we need to work extra hard to ensure that these visitors uh, continue to return to our systems to share these opportunities with their friends and families. So the images on the slide here really illustrate a range of ways that our systems adapted during the pandemic to help Minnesotans continue to experience the great benefits of our systems. So next we'll move to the part of the presentation where each of the three agencies shares an overview of our individual systems and how the Parks and Trail Legacy Fund 
is making this a critical contribution. So I'll kick us off with the metro system. Um, and just the opportunity uh, and impact that the Legacy Fund has had on uh, our recreational system, ensuring that we are able to meet the challenge, the changing needs of our region's residents as we continue to grow. So this is a map of our regional parks and trail system in the seven county metro area and the 10 regional parks implementing agencies that are responsible for owning and operating the portions of the regional system in addition to providing local uh, parks and trails opportunities as well. So they play a critical role in helping to uh, connect folks in this region to opportunities right in their own backyard. Um, and this partnership is critical to, like I mentioned earlier, providing that seamless system of nature-based parks and trails in the metro area that are really in many ways an introduction to even greater opportunities in greater Minnesota as well. So you, the dark green parts on this map, which I'm sure are a little bit hard to see because this is a 3,000 square mile area map, but uh, you can see some very large parks. Most of our parks, the larger portions of them range from 100 to 700 acres in size. And we have uh, uh, a network of existing regional trails that connect those systems across. And I'm getting ahead of myself because I realize that's also on the next slide here. <laughs> Uh, it is a nationally renowned system, and many pe people think of our system as the state parks of the metro area. Uh, we, Minneapolis and St. Paul often receive accolades for some of the rankings of first or second or top ten um, park systems in the state, uh, in the, uh, across the nation, not just in the state, but across the nation. Our system is made up of 56 regional parks and park reserves, eight special recreation features like Como Zoo, and 55 regional trails with over 415 miles of interconnected opportunities. In total, the metro regional system is almost 55,000 acres of parkland open to all Minnesotans. And we have a staggering 65 million visits to our system in 2021 alone. The Parks and Trails Legacy Fund helps make the metro system a true gateway to all of Minnesota's amazing outdoor opportunities, including the state park system and the greater Minnesota regional park system. For the Metro Regional Park System, legacy funds are distributed by a statutorily derived formula. So 90% of the funds are distributed by this formula directly to the 10 regional parks implementing agencies. This formula takes into account the relative sizes of each of the implementing agencies' parks, the number of local people that they serve, the number of non-local people they serve, and that their parks and trails attract, and how much it costs to run each agency's portion of the regional system. The remaining 10% provides funding for land acquisition through the Counts Park Acquisition Opportunity Fund. For each acquisition, legacy funds provide 45% of the total cost. The Metropolitan Council contributes another 30% of the acquisition cost, and the regional parks implementing agencies provide the final 25% of the cost. These funds are critical as we continue to grow out our regional trail system as our region continues to grow and we're able to grow uh, with the growing demand that our uh, residents have for um, connections and trails, but also um, building out the remaining portions of the regional parks and acquiring in holdings and other similar types of lands. Mm -hmm. The council coordinates the Metropolitan Regional Park System legacy project selection process, but it is the locally elected boards and commissions from the 10 regional parks implementing agencies that select the projects. Council staff review all projects for consistency with council approved park and trail long range plans, as well as ensuring that the proposed projects meet all state required guidelines. So these are just a few examples of how the Parks and Trail Legacy Fund is having a big impact on across our metro region. The slides are organized around the pillars of the 25 year plan. So on this slide you'll see uh, two of the pillars connecting people in the outdoors and acquiring land. <clears throat> one, major of our one major area of focus for our Parks and Trails Legacy investments is creating introductory experiences for new visitors. Here are two examples from Three Rivers Park District on the left and that's in western Hennepin County. The first photo shows this year's Nordic Ski Opener at Elm Creek Park Reserve. And if you didn't have an opportunity to get out there, I highly recommend it. All age levels, uh, all experience levels, including brand new beginners, whether you're five years old or 55 or 85 years old, a really great opportunity to be out with family and in such a welcoming environment um, with free ski rentals, free gear, all the things just to get people out in the outdoors as well as some introductory classes. I went out there with 
with my family uh, at this year's Nordic Ski Opener. And um, just the environment of folks supporting one another. Skis are not easy for everybody. And that's not an easy course to ski on either. But folks are really supportive um, and was just a great uh, introductory experience. The second photo shows a drawing of the new Mississippi Gateway Regional Park and Visitor Center. And this park is being completely redesigned to act as a gateway for new visitors to nature and outdoor recreation. Construction will be beginning just this spring in 2023, so we're really excited for that to come to fruition. On the right hand side of the slide here, um, it describes our land acquisition program from 2020 to 2022. And as I had described earlier, 10% of the Metro system's legacy funding is dedicated toward land acquisition across the entire region. And over these last three years, we have uh, acquired over 375 acres of land and it was $5 million in legacy funds further leveraged over $3 million of council funds and over $2.5 million of regional park implementing agency funds for those acquisitions. And then the final two pillars here on the left hand side of the slide, we highlight the create opportunities pillar at Indian Mounds Regional Park in St. Paul, the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund is making a big difference. In response to community concerns about a proposed water feature at the park, the city pivoted and used Parks and Trails Legacy Funds to develop a cultural landscape study. The process included engaging indigenous communities in decision making about this culturally significant site. The work to transform this park in partnership with indigenous communities continues today and really is a model for including cultural resources as part of our regional system. On the right hand side of the slide, we highlight Cottage Grove Ravine Regional Park. Again, the legacy fund was instrumental in helping replace a worn out visitor shelter with a beautiful community asset, the Ravine Landing Visitor Center. And if you haven't been out there, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful landscape and in the summer you'll even get to experience the goats that are used to help keep invasive species out of the park. It's just a great opportunity to be out in the ravine. And I just wanted to end with my final slide here, providing a summary of the Parks and Trails legacy allocations for the last two biennia. These allocations are making a big difference in our Metro Regional Parks and Trails system. Uh, so I know it's a big table of slides. I've talked a lot today, but I really wanna uh, thank you and turn over next to uh, Ann Pierce from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to share about their legacy work. Thank you, uh, Director. Um, um, nice job. but I. I I believe we have a question from Representative Scraba. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, Director, uh, first I wanna comment, uh, uh, since a new resident here, uh, the $11, $11 million for St. Paul Trails, uh, I use the river walk a lot. I walk it with my dog. It's uh, quite a unique trail. Um, it's, I'm a trail person. I'm from Ely. I have, I've designed trails, built trails, from nothing, um, it's very unique. Uh, the, underneath I-35, the whole thing is just, just really unique. Very, I could see why it's so much money. You know, trying to put that in a populated area. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions I had about acquiring land, and this is something that I deal with up north, is you're you're purchasing land for the parks, but are is the are you purchasing right of way also? <laughs> For the trails, is that part of the purchase, Mr. Chair? Thank you, Director Bar Bar Ross. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that is correct. Uh, the acquisition is both for uh, parkland as well as trail land. Sometimes that trail acquisition is through right of way. Sometimes it's purchasing larger <laughs> corridors of land, especially for some of our uh, destination trails that include a significant natural resource corridor as part of that trail experience. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Pierce, Director Pierce. Chairman, committee members, thank you. I'm Ann Pierce and I'm the Director of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, Parks and Trails Division. And I'm very excited to be here and talk to you about what we're doing in conjunction with our partners um, with the state parks and trails system. And get my which arrow to turn correctly. Did it move? Yep. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, so Minnesota State Parks, we have a very comprehensive system. Um, if you look at this slide, it gives you a few highlights. Since 1891, Minnesota State Park system has grown to what we have today. 
and it's one it's a nationally recognized system it's the envy of many places we have 75 state parks and state recreational areas 25 multi-use state trails 35 state water trails plus we also have state forest recreation areas public water accesses fishing piers among other things um, in 2020 during uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic uh, we had 12 million state park visitors so one of the things that uh, one of the pillars for the legacy is to connect people to the outdoors and that was a real opportunity to kind of build that correct connection and hopefully continue to have people come back to the outdoors and the state parks and the regional parks and the, all the parks around the state itself. We had 3 million state trail visitors in that same time period. In our system, we have 24,600 miles of grant and aid trails. We have 2,400 of those are OHV trails, 700 are ski trails, and 21,500 are snowmobile trails. We have 1,500 miles of developed state trails with 660 of those miles being paved trails. So a very comprehensive system, especially in, the, um, in light of the partnership with the other systems around the state. So um, I am also gonna talk on pillars from the legacy plan. And um, I'm gonna start with connecting people um, to the outdoors. Uh, a couple of things you'll see on this slide is one of the projects that we have going forward, which people may or may not have heard about, but it's the library pass program. Um, our primary strategy for connecting people to the outdoors is trying to promote innovative programming providing education and interpretation, and also outdoor skill training. And to do this, we focus also on marketing and promotions of those special events to get people to come to the system and try things out and hopefully enjoy and come back to that system. And also um, to encourage people to understand the importance of our outdoor and natural resources to our way of life for Minnesotans. So I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things we think about as we're doing this. We want to reduce barriers. We want to improve access for people. And we want to build skills. So we want people to be, feel comfortable coming to the system. And doing that, we build their skills so that they understand what to expect and things like that. So the library pass was launched in June of 2021. And um, it provides library patents the ability to check out a free state parks pass and get entry into the state park system for free. And initially, we had 71 libraries. Currently, I think we have 122, and we're continuing to expand that. Um, more than 1,900 state park passes were checked out in the first year that we had this up and running. And since then, with the expansion that we've done, we've had more than 2,100 that year. So the second year, 2,100 checkouts of those passes. So a real opportunity for people to try to do something that maybe they haven't done before, and there might have been a barrier of cost in doing that. Um, again, it's the purpose is to provide free park access. And um, in the first six months of that program, so you know, the, the first half year, we had over 1,500 people check those out. We had, we did a survey of people, and we found that 95.7% of those um, would use the library park pass again. We found that 98.8 of those using the library pass would come back to a state park again, uh, which is important because we want to continue people to enjoy what we have in Minnesota. Um, and we also noticed that a lot of the people that were using those state parks, some of the things that they enjoyed were kind of those um, low barrier activities, things such as hiking, picnicking, sightseeing, photography, things like that. Um, the parks and legacy dollars will help us in 
to continue this program through 2025 and increase the number of passes that we have out there working with the regional library system and increasing the number of people that can enjoy our state park system. Another thing that we have a program looking at is in the middle picture um, is our multicultural marketing program. So what we did was we took our, a newsletter called the Trailblazer and we really re-envisioned that to increase the diverse representation um, within that newsletter and trying to reach out to new audiences and to better reflect the diversity of state parks and trails users that are out there and how they are connecting to our natural resources and our state and regional park systems. Um, finally, on this one, if you look at the third uh, picture that's there on your right, that is the I Can program. So one of the things that we know is that people want to feel comfortable when they're doing activities. And one way that people feel uncomfortable is that when they don't really know what to do. They don't know how to do it. They don't know what to expect. They don't know, they don't have the equipment. They don't even know what equipment they need. And so one of the things we developed was what's called an I Can program. And this um, is a big part to get Minnesotans out into the outdoors and give them an opportunity to learn how to do various things. So if you look at that slide, you can see the I Can program for I Can Camp, I Can Paddle, and I Can Mountain Bike. And what we do in that is we provide friendly instruction for novices and the necessary equipment. So they don't need to bring anything. They don't need to have the equipment. They don't need to understand even how to use the equipment. They come and it's uh, no expense is necessary for them. So it's an opportunity for parents who may not have grown up getting outdoors to take their kids, introduce them to the outdoors with no um, uncertainty about how, how they're gonna go about doing things. Um, a couple other pillars that we're looking at is take care of what we have. And if you look at our park system, we have a large park system. There's a lot of uh, trails. There's a lot of infrastructure in those. And one big piece of that, and what we have heard from the public, is that they want us to maintain what we have. So they want us to create new opportunities, but they also want us to maintain what we have. And that does... Um, take an effort and that's where the take care of what we have comes in. And so part of providing a welcoming experience to people in, in the parks and trail users is to meet their expectations. So they wanna have quality facilities. Um, this is an example of a renovated shower and restroom building at a state park and um, thinking about making sure that people have access to those buildings, that they can get into those buildings um, it may be ADA accessibility that we need to think about in those systems because again, some of our um, infrastructure was built um, earlier in the century or in the last century or even in the last century and um, it doesn't always have those amenities to make it easy for people, all people to access uh, what they need. And then also creating opportunities. So if you look at the picture on your right, this is an example of the Glacial Lakes State Trail. And this is a connecting piece with the trail and with Sibley State Park. So people can uh, plan their trip to go down a nice long bike ride on this trail and then connect to a state park and maybe go there and camp or go there and have a picnic and make it a really um, comprehensive experience for them and also welcoming and uh, easy to use. Sorry. And then just a little bit more on that uh, creating opportunities. Um, I think probably many of you have uh, heard about the Shiprock Creek Campground. And I just wanted to highlight a, that is a continuing project that we're continuing to work on. But this is a really nice example of where partnerships come in. Um, so the uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources um, created an opportunity, this was part of the original um, park plan. And so we created an opportunity to create uh, very accessible campgrounds 
that were also connected to other systems. And so not only to a state trail system, but also to a county trail system. We partnered with Lake County to get this work accomplished. We also partnered so that people wouldn't have to access the park by going on a road. We partnered with MnDOT to get a tunnel under a, a bridge through. And so a lot of opportunities for us to think about how do we make so this, this experience enjoyable, comfortable, where people really want to under, to go and experience it and also feel comfortable with what they're experiencing and to have those connections so that they can enjoy all that areas have to offer. Um, and another example, just we brought up Cuyuna as we were doing our introductions. Cuyuna is another focal point, and yes, it is internationally known, nationally known. I have uh, friends that are in other states, and they keep calling me and saying, Cuyuna, we want to go to Cuyuna. And I'm like, you should go to Cuyuna. <laughs> um, and we're continuing to invest in the mountain biking opportunities that are out there. So that's another example of creating opportunities. Just really um, quickly, I want to describe how we come up with our projects and figure out how we're going to work on things. We start out with early strategic discussions, and that uh, we have those discussions with the Parks and Trails Legacy Advisory Committee, and we use our the 25-year Parks and Trails <coughs> plan to help guide us in what those uh, strategic directions are. We then work within the programs that are developing the projects to set those priorities and the objectives for each of those projects. And then we move on to develop a project list and um, begin to implement those projects. But as we do that, we have um, a review of the Parks and Trails Legacy Advisory Committee of those projects that we are working on. And then I wanted to just point out, we talked about the four pillars that we're working on, and I wanted to direct you to mainly that pie chart because I think in the slide that's going to be the easiest thing to see. If you look at what uh, that expenditures look like, we have about 25% 20 that goes to connecting people to the outdoors. We have another about 20% to create um, new opportunities. And then we listened to what people were saying, and we know we have a large and extensive system that is not young. And so we also focus on a little bit more than half of that is focused on taking care of what we have. And if you're delving into the numbers, we will have new numbers to update those numbers once the new forecast comes out. So these may be a little bit off, but the forecast will update it after the, after the forecast comes out. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Renee. Okay. Thank, and <coughs> thank you, uh, Director quick. Pierce. Is there any questions for Director Pierce? Yeah. Um, Representative Heitzman. So looking at the slide, and I forget which pillar that it fell under, but taking care of what we have. Um, I see the example there is a new shower building um, and some kind of a description. And uh, Mr. Chair, this is going to be a bigger conversation, I think, this session. But uh, a concern that I hear constantly from folks who are on the trails and visiting our parks is uh, areas that are much different than the photo. And they see infrastructure in some cases, not everywhere, but in some cases, that really needs a lot of help. And taking care of what we have is a theme here. But it is new. so. If we could talk just for a few seconds about kind of what we're doing to make sure that we're taking care of what we have, and then Mr. Chair, I'd have a comment, just a few things that we've been thinking about, you and I and others, that I want to mention, and uh, we'll uh, talk a little more about that. Director Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a replacement shower building, so it is a new shower building, and it gets exactly at what you're talking about. Um, you know, our the system has needs, definite needs for maintenance. And as we try to do that maintenance, the longer it takes to do that maintenance, it develops into replacement needs. And so what we're hoping to do is um, 
create an opportunity for us to get on a schedule for that maintenance so we won't have to create new shower buildings. But at times, depending on the age of that shower building or the, um, the uh, condition of that shower building, it's, it might be more effective to just replace that shower building. So this is a new shower building that did replace one that was already there, but you're right. Yep. Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so the other side of this mm -hmm. is, and I love hearing you say a replacement of infrastructure. I mean, that, that's unfortunately where we're at with a lot of this uh, around the state. And trails fall into this category too, of course. I have uh, acreage on both sides of the Paul Bunyan Trail as it comes through N through Nisswa, and I see what we're facing there with nearly a 20 a 20 year old uh, asphalt system. Yep. Um, and I'm just going to use this space quickly to mention that you know we do have the renewal of the ENRTF coming forward, and it's a whole different subject area. But I'm just going to float this publicly. 60% of dollars collected from the lottery drop directly into the general fund. And I'm going to mention that I think that's I think that's something that needs to be looked at very closely because all of these funds, whether it's ENRTF or legacy dollars, um, you know, at the moment, don't do as much of the taking care of what we have as I think what Minnesotans would like. And we're not going to be talking about the legacy amendment for quite a while, so ENRTF is the next thing to be discussed. And I, I think that all of us together, Mr. Chair, in a bipartisan way. And I've reached out to the governor's office on this also. Uh, need to be trying to figure out, can we more uh, strategically direct dollars towards that effort? Because if we're all being honest here today, uh, it's a drop in the bucket uh, in terms of what we're doing now to take care of what we have compared to the need. And, and I hope that uh, my suggesting that and, and uh, reaching out to folks begins that conversation. and. And we really do think long and hard about what a renewal looks like. If we're going to do that in the ENRTF category, um, and then statutorily, what we need to be doing to make sure that we're enhancing. And, and it seems that there's been some resistance to that. And I'm trying to push back on it. And I think there's a lot of like minds right now in the legislature that, that could come together and figure out you know, a really good opportunity is, is right here. We can figure out what that looks like and, and build uh, or rebuild you know, Minnesota's infrastructure and park systems and trail systems. Thank you, uh, Representative Heitzman. Representative Jaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, my first question is, uh, what's your policy on drone usage on state parks? Director <laughs> Pierce. Thank you, Chairman, committee members. Um, so I may have to look at Laura to answer this a little bit better. I, I, I'm getting everything up to speed and parks and trails is huge so there's lots of pieces that go into it that but my understanding is that um drones are not allowed to be to take off and land within a state park system and um of course flying over i think there that's a different piece than taking off and landing in a in a state park and part of that is safety um and privacy Representative Cha. Sure. And my second question is, um, do you guys keep track of the demographic of people using these parks? And uh, if so, how do you do that? Director Pierce. Chairman, committee members. So um, we have surveys that we have a annual parks survey, and we, we ask the, that type of demographic questions on those surveys. Um, so it is dependent on people filling out the survey and people being willing to share that type of demographic information. But we have it consistently so you can get trends. Even though it may not be the exact accurate number, you can actually see the trends throughout the years. Representative Chow. Um, that's all, I forgot my third question. <laughs> Thank well, you. You can ask it in a bit if you like. Director Pierce, I have a, a quick question. So uh, can you give us data on, uh, on the ICANN program? Because um, I'm not sure I see how much goes into that area. And then, and then you kind of just, you said, is it just the three ICANN programs, the camp and the bike and the, um, whatever the other one was? 
So nope. um, if we don't have the data offhand, we can get you the data. Um, just if you, like, is there specific information you're looking for? How many people participate? How many? Well, just uh, Director Pierce, so uh, just generally how much goes into that program? I, I believe that is a fully legacy uh, yeah. started initiative. Um, but how much goes into it? And then uh, maybe adding to Representative uh, Cha's question, to if we could have demographic information of who, we, I think in that case, you probably can really identify who's showing up, you know, to take, you know, to, and, it, you know, economically, you could kind of have a sense, or you, uh, or racially, or, mm -hmm. you know, um, those sort of things. So I, I would like a deeper dive on that, on that data on that okay. for all of us please R thank you chairman we will um we will get you that information okay thank so you, you can representative Cha, i think you uh yes i remember my you. question oh, that's no, great. <laughs> my third question was um did you know literature right you know handouts and uh, digital literature do you have them in other languages and um i know printing could be uh, costly but you know um do you have a digital option for other languages to maybe print out maps and parks and trails director pierce chairman committee members so um we we do have some printed materials um but in general that's not as heavy as it has been before just the printed materials just because that's not the direction people are using uh, materials uh, we do have some in other languages and that is growing and so the, those are the pieces some of the pieces that um are growing in trying to connect everyone to the outdoors. So yeah, and that's a um, you know multiple language that we're looking at and trying to find ability to create those in those languages. So it's a great idea. Thank you, Representative Shaw. Yeah, I, I think having maybe just digital literature and other languages yep. is a welcoming kind of like opening Absolutely. the door, inviting people to use the parks because in our culture, sometimes when we don't get the invitation, we don't use the parks so that could be a invitation so thank you that's all uh representative ang thank you mr chair um i'm not sure if this uh and this question could be answered today but i'm looking at slide 15 and a three rivers uh park district is within my district and i see that they have uh one of the biggest allocations um so i'm just uh making a request that if three rivers can or if you guys can follow up with me later to kind of help me. Um, I want to know where the funding was spent uh, within the Three Rivers District, um, and we can have a meeting follow up after that. Thank you. Director Barajas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative, we certainly can follow up with you and, and get that information for you. Thank you. I have one more question for you, uh, Director Pierce. So, uh, um, as we're, the world's changing and you were talking about some of these parks, are you, is there an effort with uh, these funds or other funds um, to uh, open up some of the e-world, um, like e-bikes and an e? Uh, I thought there was some funding that went towards like uh, some uh, people, you know, for devices that are mobily challenged folks. And I thought there was legacy funds going to the towards that. And I hope there is, but I don't know if that's uh, or is that in Greater Minnesota. But someone I thought was. Are you funding these or making them available? It just yeah. seems to make a lot of sense as, um, we, you know, we certainly want our physically challenged folks to have access as well. Chairman, um, yes, you're correct. So those are one of the biggest projects that we had was called the track changes or track changes, track chair project. And there are regional park systems that also have those and um, state park systems that have the track chairs and those are mobility chairs that really anyone who might have limited mobility whether it's due to age or ability to um, go for long hikes or whatever that might be can use these um, and they're very it's been a really successful program it gives people the opportunity to really be independent in that in the system and and not have to rely on on others so it's been very successful and we want to continue to do those types of things. And I will say just to get at the um, language piece, I think the digital piece is the piece that's really growing. 
And the other side of that is the interpretive information to having that in multiple language also, which we are starting and continuing to do. So, thank you. Is the mobile, is the devices you're talking, is that legacy funds or is that something else? Combination. Combination. Part the legacy funds and part um, probably general fund. Yeah. And to Representative Heitzman's question, so on the bonding, isn't there bonding money, you know, that goes to the, on the state DNR facilities? You know, I, I know through the years serving on that committee and this committee, so it's, there's some, how do you, uh, like how much, what is the bonding request for the the buildings that the, I think the governor, I heard the presentation, I can't remember the number. Right, Director so, Pierce. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm The number of the bonding requests, I will tell you that generally the bonding request is for specific projects, right? So we'll request a dollar amount for that specific project. Um, we do a combination of funding, so there's a lot of needs, like like we've been talking about, there's a lot of needs for keeping things up and maintaining things. Um, one of the sites that we have within the bonding is the Sudan underground mine, which is, a, it's a, a maintenance piece on that one. Um, so we do a combination of um, legacy funds, bonding funds, and then we do have um, some general fund requests for trail maintenance specifically um, to try to keep up. And one of the things that we're finding, especially getting at the trail maintenance piece, is um, we have increased users, and that's great. But that also shortens the life a little bit of those trails, right, because the more things going over them. And then again, we have these weather patterns that are really wet and then really dry. And then so the system is that lifespan is kind of shortening a little bit and so that maintenance becomes even more important to keep them um, up to speed. So it's a combination of things. Representative Farr. Thank you Mr. Chair, uh, Director Pierce. So I'm curious how do we source the the land for our trails? Specifically can we use eminent domain? Can the DNR use eminent domain to to purchase land for trails? We do not Dr. use Pierce. eminent domain. Okay. We don't, I don't, you know, I, I know that we do not use it, so I don't know that if we like legally can use it, but we don't use it. So. Representative Farr. So then it's it's just a voluntary basis if it's it runs across the private property? Yeah. Then can the DNR use MnDOT when they're doing a project along the road to purchase a right of way using eminent domain and then use that as a trail? So, Pierce. thank you, Chairman. Um, we would not, I mean, there might, I'm trying to think of situations where they might have already have right of way, but we wouldn't create a trail with eminent domain. So it would be access, adding to, um, and usually our trails are along county highways, not state highways necessarily, just because that's less safe and, and those kind of things. So um, I don't, I am not familiar with any situation where that has happened. I'm looking at Laura because she has probably more information on that, but no, we're not familiar with Representative that. Representative Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, perhaps I'll just follow up with you um, individually. I'd like to understand okay. that a little bit better. Okay. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Heitzman. Real quick, Mr. Chair. The proposal you just mentioned from the governor and all funds, it sounds could be combined, do we know what that number looks like for ongoing maintenance costs and such? I, um, Representative Heitzman, I don't, do, do you know? Uh, Director Pierce? Yeah, for the general fund, we had one million a year, so two million for the biennium. Yeah. Representative Heitzman. That's what I thought, Mr. Chair. So that's why I just wanted to quickly bring us back because this ongoing discussion about the ENRTF is approximately $60 million a year and I'm wondering Director Pierce, could you use $60 million a year for trails? Would that be enough to repair and restore infrastructure that we already have? Director Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. So I think there's a couple of things to think about in this. There's repair, right, and get, getting things up to um, where we want them to be. And then there's that 
ongoing maintenance because if we can get them up to where we need them, and that's probably a bigger number, right? If we can get them up to where we want them to be, that ongoing maintenance will be less if you can follow it, if you can do like a 10-year maintenance cycle, right? You won't get to the point where you have to replace a building or you have to um, replace a trail completely or whatever that case may be. So that upfront cost of getting things back into shape, so to speak, would be larger than the ongoing maintenance piece of like a cycle every um, 10 years. So then you end up within that 10 year period, you visited all your trails that you need to and, and have maintained them with ever repaving or filling cracks or whatever that might be. Yeah. Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Chair Lilly. I think what I am hearing is that uh, we could use those kinds of dollars up to 60 million potentially per year. Um, although I'm not necessarily hearing that in the answer. Uh, it, I would argue that that's probably just scratching the surface of what we could do in terms of uh, restore and uh, uh, maintain the properties and trail systems and such that we have, uh, the infrastructure needs that we have in Minnesota. Uh, but maybe we'll have to circle back. It doesn't sound like the, the uh, director had an answer today, but there might be another opportunity. Thank you, Representative Heitzman. There actually was a bill that I've been working on the last couple of years that uh, um, was brought to me, but they had uh, someone rode every mile of the trails in, in the state of Minnesota, and they had a camera on the whole time, and you can actually see the video and just see where the bumps are or the pothole, you know, the, and so the maintenance need is great, and I think it had funding related to that of, and certainly not enough, I think it was like three million or something a, a year to, to help move along. There's a lot of work to do. So thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, Ms. Madsen, welcome. Go ahead when you're ready, please. Thank you, Chair Lilly, committee members, Director. staff, and our distinguished guest, Ms. Heinzman. I have an extra pin for you if you'd like it. So I don't want you to be left out. So I'll make sure you get this before you leave. I'm Renee Madsen. I'm the Executive Director of the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. And in addition to the pins today, we also have copies of our 25-year legacy plan. This might be helpful for some of you if you haven't seen it previously. Um, it lays out a very good framework for the way the three agencies are operating. Even though we're different, we all do use this as a, as a guide for us. And I'd just like to point out also, Representative Heinzman, if you're looking for a use for that other 60%, we also have trails in Greater Minnesota. So <laughs> I'd be more than happy to help deplete that fund on behalf of our facilities. Glad to hear that. Which um, we do have six districts across the 80 counties of greater Minnesota, all with great needs. Um, great. Within those 80 counties, great. we have 13 commissioners and uh, one at large, uh, two in each district and one at large. Those are appointed by the governor. And I'd like to point out that the chair of our commission, our uh, Commissioner Rick Anderson is here today with us. Rick hails from Lyon County, um, from the beautiful city of Ballatin. So he is here with us today. Throughout our district, as you'll see on the map, uh, we have currently 74 facilities across most of those 80 counties. And of those 35 are natural resource-based parks, 24 are regional trails, and 15 are special features. And just to give you an idea of what those special features might be, um, for instance, we have the Cook County Mountain Bike Trail System. And as Commissioner, or excuse me, as Executive Director Pierce was talking about, we have the um, Lake County Mountain Bike Trail System. And that's the beautiful system that connects up to the Shipwreck Creek uh, campground at Split Rock Lighthouse. So that's one of our designated facilities that was built purposefully to connect with that campground to give campers there a wonderful trail experience. And the interesting thing about that is a lot of our green mountain bike trails connect from that campground into the larger system. So it's a great place to give first time users a real taste of what uh, camp or that system is like. And then in addition to that, we have 20 designation eligible facilities. And what that means is in our process, it's a two-step, I'll get into that in just a minute, but we have a two-step process for um, designating a facility in greater Minnesota as regionally significant, meaning it, it is not your local park that's probably quite beautiful, um, but it is more in line with the metropolitan 
Park System or the DNR Park System. It's a large facility. It draws uh, a number of, it draws visitors from across a great region, so it's more than just a local system. So in the first phase of becoming designated with the designation application that's reviewed, if you are ranked high, we consider that facility as designation eligible. So in addition to the 74 facilities we have now, 20 are eligible to become designated. What we're waiting on from those facilities is a qualified master plan for review. So in coming years, we know we'll be adding more facilities to our system as well. Our process uh, for adding a facility into our system um, is a two-step process, the final step in that process being eligible for funding. And um, it, it, it's an interesting system that has evolved over time. The commission was started in 2013, so this is only our 10th year. And one thing that I would tell you that we're very proud of is the fact that we keep changing what we're doing to make sure that as constituents are coming back to us um, who have applied for either funding or designation, that we're listening to what they have to say. It's not a static process, it's very dynamic. For instance, every year we look at our funding application and we meet and we talk about it and we listen to what people have said and try to determine where we can make things better for them. It's not something that's carved in stone and we're never gonna change it. In fact, we change it a little bit every year based on what we hear. Um, our designation application is the first step. So if you think you have a great facility somewhere in the 80 counties outside of the metropolitan area, you submit an application online. And that's a high bar because once you are designated, you have access to legacy funds that not every facility, of course, has access to. So we want to ensure that that facility is, has a great purpose, a great draw, and serves a regional audience. So that first step is an application, and it's reviewed not by myself. Um, I am, we have two people who work for the commission. We're not only um, very nimble, but we're very small. Uh, there's no bricks and mortar. But we do have a five-member evaluation team, and they're, evalu they're professionals that are retired from Parks and Recreation. Uh, one is a former DNR uh, grant manager, and he has a huge wealth of information about uh, the state uh, facilities. But between these five individuals, they're located across the state. If they don't know or have heard about a facility, it would be pretty rare. So they go through our funding, or excuse me, our designation criteria. They pay attention to uh, the application to make sure it's not just a lot of flowery words, but there's actually things to back that up. Um, if that is reviewed uh, high, medium, or low, high is you're eligible to, uh, we invite you to submit a master plan. Medium or low, we ask you to come back. There's usually some comments that the evaluation team has made about how you can make that application better. And then there are two of us who work for the commission and we go visit those facilities. We wanna make sure that we understand them. We understand their regional focus. We can ask questions. Sometimes the commissioners will have questions. Sometimes the evaluation team has questions. So the best part of my job is getting to do a lot of driving to lots of great locations in greater Minnesota and look at facilities that um, become designated later that are fabulous for us. So if you're designated, if you reviewed the application and you rank high, you're designation eligible, and then we ask facilities to submit to us a qualified master plan. We have very st stringent um, requirements for what we're looking for in a master plan so that we're reviewing every facility apples to apples. And that's evolved over time as well. So you submit your master plan into our portal that we've developed online uh, for review and one thing I'd point out about this portal it's available to everybody whether or not you are planning to become designated in the greater Minnesota regional system you have access to this portal to create a master plan um, we think master plans are vital to developing a facility and listening to what people in that area want to see in a facility so uh, we've made this portal available for communities <coughs> small and large well-funded not uh, to be able to use this portal to develop their own master plan. Generally, uh, facil facilities and trails would need to hire experts maybe to develop a schematic or to work on the public engagement process. But instead of a master plan costing many, many thousands of dollars, we know that that's the case generally, you can create your own master plan uh, for much smaller dollar amounts. And that makes it 
much more even playing field for facilities, areas that may not have uh, the resources that other areas do. Um, so it's, it's been a great uh, thing that we've done for our partners and we've had several uh, agencies actually submit master plans where they've gone from start to finish themselves and created their own master plan. And it prints out a beautiful document when you're done that you can take to anybody because you can plug and play your pictures as you go. But it's really made it a much more even process for cities and counties that don't have deep pockets to be able to do. And then finally, of course, is the funding application. That's the fun stuff um, where facilities can submit to us projects that come out of that qualified master plan then. All of the projects that uh, we look at for funding have to tie back to that master plan in some way, shape, or form. So our selection process I've reviewed just a bit, but I do want to go back to the track wheelchair question you had. And yes, that came out of um, Greater Minnesota. Well, we all have wheel track wheelchairs in our systems, but last year at a meeting, we had an opportunity to look at how track wheelchairs work. And I would tell you that I had not been on one before, wasn't particularly familiar with them. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, you know. There are many ways that people can't enjoy the outdoors as they've been used to. And as I get older, I hate to admit it, but um, I, I can see a time when I'm going to need a little assistance too to do what I, I enjoy doing. Hopefully that's many years down the road, but we're trying to think more broadly about what's stopping people from doing things that they used to enjoy doing or how to engage people where they haven't been able to do these activities. So the commissioners set aside out of our grant round from last year, the grants that we did, um, a sum of money to encourage our facilities to apply for track wheelchair funding. And we were able to come up with an amount working with Action Manufacturing out of Marshall, Minnesota, who produces these chairs. Um, they came down on their pricing, so there was a small gap for a match of only $500. And we had three wonderful applications that came in for these wheelchairs. Um, some wanted, they all wanted to do amazing things with them, and some were upgrading their uh, wheelchairs to be able to do to do more things with them. Um, and at the end of the day, we thought that awarding one grant to one of the three facilities would be a travesty. So uh, the other two wheelchair grants are going to come out of our operating budget because uh, we just felt it was really important to be able to do that. And it's going to be a component of this next granting round that we do as well. Part of the, the deal with these wheelchair grants was that if you did get a, a track wheelchair, you had to make it available for facilities in the system to try to see if they, it was something that they wanted to do within their system. And the way that the grants worked out, there was one in Duluth, uh, there was one in Lyon County, and one in uh, Wright County. So it really worked out statewide pretty good distribution that uh, other facilities will be able to use those wheelchairs in their system and, and hopefully go forward and apply for a grant in this coming round. So uh, just quickly, our, our grant funding application opens up on April 1 or thereabouts uh, of every year. We grant annually, so our new funding round will be coming up shortly. It closes on July 31st. Uh, we typically get between 19 and 24 applications for our designated facilities, uh, always for more funds than we have available, just like our partners. Um, and then we spend uh, the next six weeks driving around the state to look at these applications, make sure, again, that we understand them, we're fully apprised of what they're looking for in these applications. Um, and then do a report back to the commissioners where we've scored our applications based on criteria that we have. And the commissioners spend the next two and a half to three months uh, talking about the applications, asking us more questions, uh, vetting them further, until finally we whittle that down to uh, the, ap the uh, proposals for funding that we'll be bringing forth this session, which are here. We had 17 applications that were qualified in this last round. Happily, we were able to grant funding fully to 14 of them. And what I'd point out to you here, you'll see some big numbers. The commission is very fortunate that in our grant funding, we don't have a ceiling. So if you have a project that's particularly uh, costly to build out, you'll notice Olmstead County, Oxbow Park, and Zolman Zoo, $2 million, a little bit more. That zoo is, re uh, excuse me, that campground is replacing one um, that is, was built in a floodplain. Wasn't the great uh, best idea uh, 
40 years ago or so when it was created. It floods out on a pretty regular basis. So they're going to move that campground to a different area of the park, um, add more camping sites to it, uh, more handicapped camping, camping sites as well as some camper cabins that have been requested. And they came to us also with a very healthy match. But I want to point out that this is an example of what we can do when you don't have a ceiling. You don't have those applicants in the hamster wheel of $400,000 grants every year for a number of years while costs escalate. We can do the facility, we can do the build out, we can do what they're looking for, be it connecting people with the outdoors, taking care of what we have, creating and acquiring, um, but it's done. And now it's done and it's available for, for public use, which is the best we could all hope for. So it's, it's, it's ready for Minnesotans to enjoy. And likewise, we have a lot of smaller grants. You'll notice one uh, for Northerly Park in the Northwest Angle. That's a $70,000 grant, and that grant uh, is to enhance their master plan. They did a master plan in our portal, but they, we all recognize there's more that they could do with that park. It's the first place that you come to, Jim's Corner, when you cross from Canada back into the U.S. in the Northwest Angle. There are some wonderful plans that they have, but we felt they could take it one step higher. There's a lot of wonderful interpretation and history in that area. And our hope is that when they start working with a consultant, they can get it um, at a higher level that we felt it, it deserved. So while they did come to us with a plan, the commission has on occasion granted funds to just take it up a notch for areas that, that maybe had more to offer than was being shown in that plan. So that's, that's a look at uh, the types of things that we do um, for our grants. And we're very pleased to be able to do that on an annual basis with our 20% share of the legacy funds. We're very grateful for those. And this is just another look at some of the variety that we have across our system. Um, you'll notice the mountain bikes. We have a lot of wonderful mountain bike trails um, in districts one and two particularly. The picture on the lower left is Phelps Mill County Park in Ottertail County. It's a wonderful facility. It's also a special feature, but it's just a fabulously historic area. And they recently got into our system and were successful in applying for a grant for boardwalks through a very sensitive area. And that's probably going to be the first of several grants they'll come back to us for, but it's a certainly a remarkable facility and something that deserves to be visited and, and known about by everyone. We've got uh, our horse riders in uh, Lyon County, Garvin Park, which is a spectacularly large park. We have the Northwest Regional Sporting, uh, the Northwest Sporting Center in Beltrami County. So that's an example of something that's a little bit different, but it's a sport that's growing tremendously. The commission helped them from the very beginning um, and we were a small piece, actually. They were very successful in gaining lots of partners to build this facility on 320 acres in Beltrami County. And it's pretty spectacular, really, and has grown over time. And then finally, Spirit Mountain Recreation Area in Duluth, Minnesota. So that is just a brief overview of what the commission does. Uh, on the table and in the back as well is our 2022 policy and planning piece. I've given this to most of you over time, a uh, few more meetings with some of you yet, um, but this is available for your review as well. And of course, we're always available to answer any questions you might have. So thank you, uh, Ms. Madsen, I, Director Madsen. Um, I really want to thank you for that, uh, that uh, brochure you just held up. It's, uh, um, I think it's one of the best pieces that I've seen yeah, you know, come through this committee as far as uses of the funds and how your plans are and how you plan to to use them. So I hope members have an opportunity to really look at it and study it. And I hope uh, others in the room are watching and listening because I think that's important that we know where all the funds are going in, you know, every, every different fund. And uh, I just think it's really helpful. It's a bit of a challenge to the to, to our friends next to you, I, I hope they are listening. And, uh, you know, not that they're doing bad work, but it just, uh, it's nice to see exactly where uh, the funds are going. Um, Representative Heitzman, I believe you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, when folks were uh, initially given the opportunity to decide whether or not to vote for the legacy amendment, I think that what we're hearing about today is is primarily what what in greater Minnesota 
they were expecting. And it's really terrific to see all of the implementation of legacy dollars in this subject area. Sometimes there's questions as to what was the voter's intent, and we speak to that from time to time as legislators, try to sort of channel that, and I'm not sure we get it right all the time, but uh, the theme that I've sort of been hitting on today, I'm just gonna continue and just ask quickly, Director Matson, and maybe you have these numbers, maybe you don't. If you don't, that's okay, offline we can discuss this, but uh, do you have a ballpark idea what the system needs are as it relates to infrastructure and that restoration and enhancement of those uh, facilities that are inside of your service area, what the annual need might be? Director Madsen. Chair Lilly, uh, committee members. That is an excellent question. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I can get you those numbers because as we look at the master plans that are uh, provided to us and as we check off uh, various capital projects and enhancement projects that happen. We do keep track of that, that in our system. So I would be more than happy to give you that information because again, as we're pointing out things, grants that are coming through, that is taking care of particular pieces of master plans and we have the idea of what those build outs are as we go along. Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Chair. And I would extend that request to each of those here today. That would be helpful, I think, as we're continuing to try to figure out what uh, the future might look like for, as I mentioned earlier, the ENRTF and what the system really needs annually. I think that that would give legislators a good tool to sort of consider as a benchmark going forward. Thank you. Representative Cha. Thank you, Chair. My first question is, uh, what's the minimum acreage um, you know, to, to put a park into this application? Ms. Madsen. Chair Lilly, Representative Cha. Um, for a natural resource-based park, the minimum is 100 acres. Our special feature parks can be much smaller um, because they have a particularly unique special feature to them that's not found other places. But 100 acres is our minimum. Representative Cha. Yes, and then my second question is that, um, is this application process open to indigenous uh, communities if they wanted to convert some of their land into parks? Director Madsen. Chair Lilly, Representative Cha, that's a great question and that's one of the things that we are changing about our process. Um, we did cr come up with a designation called a co uh, cooperative partnership and that allows us to have uh, facilities Generally, the way the statute is written is that it is available for cities and counties in the 80, county, uh, out, 80 counties outside the metropolitan area. So that eliminated uh, quite a few uh, indigenous communities from being able to apply. The supportive partnership piece of this allows us to be able to do that. So if there is a particular um, facility um, on land not owned by the city or county, there are things that we can do in support of that entity that would enhance that facility, even though it is not technically part of uh, the system that we would look at normally. So that's an example of someone coming to us with and having long conversations about how do we better connect this because our, our charge is clear that it's cities and counties, but this is a way that we can be supportive to facilities um, outside of that charge. Representative Cha. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? Yes. Okay. Representative uh, Hussein. Just to follow up uh, Representative Chao's question, uh, do, how do we uh, help you? Uh, is there any way we could do uh, to kind of the statue so those individuals could be able to apply direct for that funding? Um, Director Madsen, I, or? Uh, well, um, Chair Lilly, Representative Hussein, we'd have to look at that, uh, that change. We, we were hoping by making this supportive partnership change, um, that would allow more of a partnership across tribal lands, indigenous entities, and, and actually others. I mean, we're, what we're trying to do there is open it up to facilities like the Superior Hiking Trail or the North Country Trail, where technically we cannot um, support that whole system because of where it runs, 
but we can be supportive of trailheads, repairs, camping sites. Um, we, we think of fishing piers, uh, kayaking launches, those sorts of things within facilities. So at this point, I'd say give us time to see how this plays out and see if we need to make further changes. Um, because we are open to that. We just need to see how it's working at this point. Representative Hussein. If that makes sense. I just thank you and I look forward uh, to working with you. And we always talk about equity and disparities and we want to make sure that people are, have opportunity to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry to get on the praise train for the greater Minnesota folks, but here's another, maybe you want to make a comment on uh, the last couple of years we've in this committee, we have been talking about diversity and, um, and you listened and you made an effort and uh, to your to your credit, I maybe you don't want to say it, but I mean it actually didn't go well. But I I give you credit because you're trying, and uh, and I hope others are trying. But uh, maybe you want to speak to that for a second, and uh, so you spun off some of your money, if I if I remember, and then but maybe you can go into better detail. And I think it's good for members to hear. And Thank then, you. But you're still trying. It was just. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Chair Lilly. And that's something I had shared with you in the meeting, and I'm glad that we could have that prior. We our system is not owned or managed, none of these 74 facilities, by the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. They are all independently owned and operated. Um, and so we have little weight to bear as to how facilities come to us for funding applications. But the commissioners recognized a few years ago we need to do more around connecting people with the outdoors. Let's make sure that it's an easy ask for our facilities so that they're not weighing, do we rehab a facility that really is tired and worn out? Do we build something new that's been asked for in this master plan or do we connect people with the outdoors? And you know where that goes often, it's well, we have a really aging facility we need to fix or everybody wants us to build this new whatever. Mm -hmm. By offering connecting people with the outdoors as a separate grant entity within our bigger grants, people could apply for both. So now it's not a either or, it's a yes and, um, so that we could encourage people to do those connecting pieces and make sense in their communities, be it transportation so that you can get people there who can't afford the transportation, schools can come in, use your imagination, whatever that is. So last year we set aside um, $200,000 for, we had been doing the connecting piece and we just weren't getting enough creative ideas that we were hoping for, something that would be just out of the box that you hadn't thought of because you didn't want to not get accepted for this grant. So we made it pretty open and said, come to us with any ideas that you've had about how to creatively get more people into your facility and make it easier and make it welcoming and think of all, everyone, one Minnesota. Um, and so we, we filled out that grant process and we had some wonderful uh, connecting people with the outdoor grants, but they weren't exactly what we were hoping we might seed for ideas. So. It, wa it was successful in that we got some really great uh, connecting pieces. A lot of it was equipment that will be available for people to try uh, at no charge, and that's terrific. Others was, were programming, but not the really kind of out of the box thinking we had hoped for. So we're going to continue with that uh, and try to encourage people to just think as creatively as they can about what would welcome someone into your park. Um, you know, you brought up e exactly uh, different languages. We don't want that to be a barrier. So uh, that was an example we gave and it didn't necessarily go as far anywhere. <laughs> I'll be honest, not as far as we hope, it didn't go where we wanted. But we're going to continue to do that because it can't be a one and done, it didn't work, so let's just drop it. We still need to work with everyone to encourage that kind of thinking and make it available for everyone. So thank you, Chair Lilly. Thank you, uh, Representative Cha. Yeah, I just want to add to that. Sometimes having a person that looks like the community advocating for these parks and stuff is going to go a long way. You know, having the literature is not enough, but then having a person that can speak the language or understand the barriers of communities and, um, you know, just, you know, loss in translation things, right? And so uh, I encourage that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cha. Um, so I think we're basically uh, um, kind of there. Thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, um, and certainly we'll have you back as we transition into more of the funding side. But I, 
I definitely wanted our, our members to, to hear what's going on um, in your areas. It's, uh, you know, I, I know coming out of COVID, it's continued to be popular and I'm always, you know, stunned by the numbers in the Metro, you know, I, I'm a Metro member, but you know, 65 million users is incredible. And, you know, to think like in Minneapolis, you know, where they had to shut down streets like during COVID and then now the interests are higher, but we certainly want these, you know, people, I love the ICANN program that you're doing that. And uh, I certainly hope we can have more of that and all over the state and ac accessibility. Uh, um, I'd like to, personally, I'd like to see more fishing piers, you know, all, you know, all over. I know there's one that's fairly close to me and it was um, done, you know, by legacy funds because I see the logo, mostly I see it in the winter because it's on the lakes, uh, you know, when you're uh, cross country skiing, you can see it because it's like there. <laughs> and also it's interesting because those are done by, I think it was Mincor and I don't know if Mincor is still building those uh, fishing piers or not, but this uh, yeah. Barharast, do you know if they're still building them or? Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if they're still building them, but you're right, they're much more visible in the winter <laughs> on the white snow lakes. But uh, I just want to thank you for coming and uh, I, I was really touched particular today by the library uh, program and it just seems like something that we could certainly uh, add to like the metro system would make a lot of sense to me to, um, you know, I think some people might be priced out of some of the county parks or some of them to, to entrance, uh, you know, to get their family in there. So it just make, and maybe it's available already, I don't know, but Ms. Barharas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just add that the Metro Parks system is free um, to all users. Specific programs Ooh. might cost money. If you're going to ski, there's a ski pass, especially on groom trails, typically because of the cost for grooming and maintaining the trail themselves or if there's snowmaking. But otherwise, access to the parks themselves is free. Some of the counties do have uh, <laughs> like do. a vehicle fee. Vehicle but, fee. Uh, I'm, I appreciate your coming in today. And again, members, thank you for rushing over uh, after, you know, session and getting here. And please be available for questions, uh, everyone. And uh, with that, uh, we are adjourned.